So this video finds us starting unit number five. It's our very first lesson, and we're going to be looking at something called definite integrals today. And we're going to start off by introducing this with a little bit of a physics story, just so you can kind of see the motivation for this whole second half of calculus. Uh, got a little demand here to see if we can figure out how far some object is going down the road, what kind of distance it's going to cover, if we know its velocity. So the starting off question says, hey, well, what if we knew the velocity was always 12 meters per second? So maybe I'll do a little graph of V and T. And my units for my up and down axis are going to be meters per second. And for T, they're going to be seconds. And this first story says, oh, well, the velocity is going to be nice and stable. It's going to be a nice, easy story. Velocity is steady at 12, just all day long, just rock solid, going at 12 meters per second. And they're asking us, well, how far do you think this thing is going to go during the time between t equals 1 and t equals 4? That's the beginning and the end of the story. So actually, this question's not all that hard. Uh, there are three seconds of time that are going to happen in between time 1 and time 4 seconds. Right? So that is three seconds. And apparently we're, we're always going, you know, just looking at this graph here, we're always going 12 meters per second. So if I'm always going 12 meters per second, and I'm going to do that for three seconds, that's just going to be 12 plus 12 plus 12. And really all I'm doing is multiplying the 12 and the 3 together. So yeah, this distance, not too hard to figure out for this one. It's just going to be 12 meters per second multiplied by the three seconds. But then when you start looking at this and asking yourself, okay, geometrically, what did we just do? The answer is you just found the area underneath this graph. That area is equal to 36. And so this is actually a really common physics need, right? To figure out, well, how far will something go if you know the velocity and you know how much time is gonna go by? Uh, you really are just finding the area under the curve. And that's great if it's a nice, stable, flat curve. And you can say, ah, it's just a rectangle. But here comes the bigger question. What if the velocity wasn't so stable? What if your velocity axis looks like this, time axis here? Got this velocity measured in meters per second, time in seconds. And what if the actual description of your velocity is that V is t squared. Whatever the time is, you square it to find the velocity. Or another way to think about it, you know, if you're graphing on your graphing calculator, if you were to look at y equals x squared. Well, it's a parabola, or at least half of a parabola. And if somebody asks you the same question, how far are we going to be able to go? What kind of coverage of distance can we get from time one all the way out to time four? Well, that's, uh, that's kind of a big challenge because Sure, you can look at it and say, wow, it's no big deal. It's actually just the area underneath this graph from time one to time four. The trouble is the top of that shape is all very curvy. And this brings in now the, the second really important question of calculus. The first was about tangent lines. But now we're going to have to try to figure out perfect areas under curves. If we can do it, if we can come up with a plan to find the perfect area under this curve, then no matter what that velocity story looks like, we can go and figure out how far this car is going to go. Um, but it's just going to be a really big challenge trying to find the area under that curve. So answers to some questions here, I think we've already touched on them. Uh, what do we need to find the distance now? Well, you have to find the area underneath the velocity time curve. That is the second big question in calculus. I'm going to scribble on this graph. You probably don't want to follow me because I'm going to mess the graph up. But the first big question was, could we do tangent lines? You know, if you went to like time three, could you go and draw in the perfect tangent line? Because if you could, then you would know the acceleration instantly at time three. And that was the derivative, right? That was the first big challenge of the course. How do you find perfect slopes of tangent lines? Now we're going to try to find perfect areas under curves. And there's a plan for doing that. Today, it's just going to be a really, really coarse approximation. right? Actually, look and actually at the title up at the top of the page. It says, OK, can we do this estimating area with 
finite sums of rectangles. Think of that as trying to say with just a few rectangles being added up. So sure, it can be done. How do you approximate that answer? Well, we're going to use this technical thing called the rectangular approximation method. That's a lot of words. It's hard to say that. So we're going to abbreviate it. How about we call that R-A-M? Just meaning, yeah, you can abbreviate that with some rectangles. I like to call it just little ribbons of area. And you'll see why I call it that on the next page. Okay, I want to show you a few different rectangular approximation methods. We're actually going to use this same story of trying to find the distance that you go for those three seconds as we look at these next graphs on the next page. So it's the same story. I still have this velocity that's equal to t squared. Got a velocity axis there and a t axis. And we're going to see if we can come up with some plans. Along the way, we're going to need to know how tall the y values are for this curve. So I'm just going to put four of them in on my journey from time one all the way to time four. In fact, why don't I go and just put in the actual points? This one is one over for time and one up for velocity. This next one is two over for time and four for velocity, right? After all, it's just V equals T squared. Three, nine, and then the last one is four, 16. Okay, still working on this plan of trying to figure out how much area is there under the curve from time one all the way to time four. Now on this page, you're going to be totally disappointed by how bad the estimations are. That's okay. We're just trying to come up with a plan for how this works. The first plan I want to show you is something called LRAM. That actually stands for left RAM. What's going to make this thing a left RAM story is we're going to raise up some little ribbons until the left side of the ribbons is going to touch. Okay, so left side touches. Here, here's what I mean by that. Let me just go and grab a little ribbon of area. I'm going to draw one right in here, okay, between time two and time three. And yeah, let's just highlight it with a little bit of red paint. What I want to do is bring that ribbon up until it's high enough, right? Some sort of height that I like. And I'm going to be satisfied as soon as the left side touches. Let me just see if I can make that look a little nicer. There we go. Yeah, that looks great. So raising the ribbon up, raise, 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 raise. You know, when should I stop? Should I stop here? Should I stop here? There, right? I'm just trying to estimate the area under this curve. Well, for an LRAM, we're going to stop here. As soon as the left corner of that ribbon touches the curve, it's going to be at the point two, four. Now, I'm going to do a really horrible approximation because I'm only going to use three of these ribbons. So it's not going to be very good, but that's okay. And each time I'm going to raise them up until their left side, their left corner touches. That first one's pretty darn short. And then that one goes there. Now, really important thing to notice, this last point here at 416. Right now, I don't even need it. Uh, that'll be important later for some other approximations that we're going to do. But right now, it's just kind of getting in my way. And I just want to go off on a bit of a tangent for a minute and just show you a picture to talk about something called fence post errors. And it's an issue that's going to show up right now when we look at these ribbons and the Y values that we have access to. So imagine there's this beautiful green field, right? I mean, what could be more perfect than some nice, beautiful green grass? And then somebody comes along and says, I'm going to build a fence. So they go to the hardware store and they buy some fence posts. They go to the field and they go boom, 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 boom. And they put in these four fence posts, right? I think it looks kind of ugly now, but they're like, oh, no, it's going to be a great fence. The next day, they come back with the materials to put in the little runs that go between the fence posts. Now, there are four fence posts, but you only have to build one, two, three runs that go in between. So there's always one less run than there are fence posts. Right? You need to be aware of that 
when you're thinking about what Y values you need as we go to do this story about these ribbons. I don't need all the Y values here, not for an LRAM. I don't need to know that this last point at the end of the day is actually 16 high. I only need to know where this point is. That's where that last ribbon's going to attach. Okay, so my estimate of this area, this area is going to be adding up these ribbons. Man, this is going to be a horrible approximation of the area under the curve, but here goes. First ribbon is one tall and one wide. The next ribbon is four tall and one wide. And the last ribbon is nine tall and one wide. And I never use the 16. And this area approximately is 14. So that would be 14 meters of distance, approximately. It's horribly wrong because these rectangles, I mean, look at all the area in here and in here and in here, they're missing. But right now we don't care. We're like, no, 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 it's okay. We're just using a small number of rectangles and coming up with a plan. That plan is called LRAM. Now, there's a little program that you can use on your graphing calculator to do this, and I'm going to show it to you in a minute, but I'm going to show you the whole page first, and then I'll show you the program. I'm going to try to talk you out of ever using this program. Okay, the next method, same question from one to four seconds, same graph. Let's look at something called RAM. And as you can imagine, this stands for the right rectangular approximation method. Same graph, velocity going on here, time going along the bottom, and we're going to raise up some ribbons. I don't even really care how many ribbons you use right now, right? It's just a finite number, a few ribbons. But the key thing, we want to raise these ribbons up until their right side of each ribbon touches the graph. Okay, well, I've got these fence posts, if you wish, here and here and here and here, four fence posts. And I'm only going to need three of them when I go to decide where to put the ribbons. I'm going to take these ribbons, let's start off with this middle one, and I'm going to raise them up until their right hand corner touches the graph. So that's going to be there. That's how tall that ribbon should be. And yeah, you can see that it's actually overestimating the graph, right? Like, look at all this extra area there. But that's okay. I'm not worried about that. I'm just trying to come up with a general plan right now. Well, that's one ribbon. I'm going to do a few more. The ribbon here, one wide, raised up until it touches there. And then the last ribbon, raised up until it touches there. I didn't even need the first Y value, the first fence post value. Don't need it. For this right approximation, this right RAM, I would say the area, according to my estimation, is going to be, all right, first ribbon, four tall, one wide. Next one, nine tall, one wide. And then finally, 16 tall, one wide. And this estimate is a lot more than the last one, 29 meters of distance. Both of those estimates are horribly wrong. Here's one that's, you know, maybe a little bit better, and it's something called MRAM. A lot of work to create this one. I don't know whether it's worth it, but it is out there, okay, and it's called MRAM, and it stands for middle RAM. The idea is, what if we take some time and painstakingly go and find out how tall the graph is at the middle point in the ribbons. Still going to use just three ribbons here. And I want to make sure that the middle touches. Well, it's quite a bit of effort involved to find these Y values, but, but here they are. This first one, it's over at 1.5 seconds and when you go 1.5 squared this y value is 2.25 this next dot on the graph that i'm going to use to locate my ribbons it's two and a half seconds in and it ends up being 6.25 and the last one three and a half seconds in 12.25 when i square 3.5 
Okay, here come the ribbons. This first one, I'm gonna raise it up until it just has its middle touching. Same plan here, raising it up until its middle touches, and then raising this one up until its middle touches. This looks a bit better. You know, it's kind of overestimating on one corner and underestimating on another. And if I try this out to see how much area we've got, just as an estimate, that ends up being 2.25 times 1 plus 6.25 times 1, and then one more ribbon plus 12.25 times 1. That estimate of the area ends up being 20.75 meters. It's also wrong, by the way, right? but it's another option to try to estimate how many meters of distance you've had in this story when this velocity is growing, right? This VT graph is actually getting taller as time goes by. Okay, well, there was a little reference to a program here that you might want to try on your graphing calculator. Hmm, questionable, right? But if you want to try it, um, there's one that you can download from me called RAM Graph. And it draws a little picture and then figures out the rectangular approximation method. I would suggest to you, it's not worth the hassle of downloading it. And when you run it, it does make changes to your calculator in terms of moving the axes and stuff around. And a lot of students don't like what it does to their calculator. So it might be safer just to watch what it does to mine instead. To use it, the first thing you'd have to do is put in the function into y1. It's got to be in y1. So I could say, okay, y equals x squared. That's the best thing I can do for v equals t squared. Okay, so that sits in there. And now I'm going to go and run this program called RAM graph. And I've got a few programs in my calculator, so I just have to go down and find it here. There it is. So I'm going to run RAM graph, and it asks me a few questions. It says, hey, what's the value of A? Well, that's where the story begins on the across axis. So for me, that would be 1. And I hit enter. It says, well, where's B? Where do you want to stop? That's the 4. So I type in 4. And then it says, how many ribbons do you want? How many subintervals do you want? Right? It could have asked me how wide you want them to be. Here it's just asking me how many. So I'll say three, and it'll know that they need to be one wide. And it is kind of neat because it draws little pictures for you. So I hit enter, and it's going to think about it for a second, and it says, okay, check out this picture. And it's drawn a nice little picture of left attached, right, of left RAM. And it's waiting for me here. When I hit enter, it says, hey, that answer was 14. Yeah, we already figured that out. And if I hit enter again, it says, well, check out this picture. Here's the right attached picture. It's like, okay. I hit enter and it says, that one's 29. Or I hit enter again, and it says, here's what it looks like when it's middle attached. And the value for that is 20.75. I mean, yeah, it works, but it does make some changes to the settings in your calculator, and you might not actually want to use it. For the few times it would be handy, it's probably not worth it. Okay, so there we were doing these three ribbons coming up with horrible answers for how much area there is under the curve. And then the next page asks the question, well, if you've got those three to choose from, which one is the best? And I'm going to give you my honest answer here. Which one's the best? Well, they are all bad. They're horrible. Whether it's left or right or middle, they're horrible. But they all get better when you put more and more ribbons in. So I tried running that program again and again and again, and here's what I noticed. Okay, so this might be worth saying here, because it's kind of a key thing in the chapter. But they all improve with thinner ribbons. By thinner, you're definitely going to have more ribbons. And so I asked that program to try it out a few different times with different numbers of ribbons. You've already seen the three. Here's middle RAM. Not that it's any better than the others. But I got 20.75. When I tried it out with 28 ribbons, 
after all that time putting it in, okay, yeah, it came back and it said 20.9971. Interesting. I tried it with 100. Sure looked like a neat picture. And the calculator came back and said, well, after 100 ribbons, it's 20.9997. And I think you can see where we're going with this. We're basically doing a limit as the number of ribbons just escalates to some super high value. And they become thinner and thinner and thinner. I have the feeling that the correct answer for this is probably 21, just from looking at that. Um, and that's kind of the idea of this chapter. Now, example number one says, hey, why don't you use middle RAM to estimate the area under this curve? Well, I'm going to give you a better idea. Instead of using middle RAM, let's actually use a different feature in your calculator that, that does a whole bunch of ribbons. And I think it's going to do a really nice job. So what I would do in order to get this to work is I'm going to go and put that function into y1 right? it could be in any of them but i'm going to put it into y1 two times the sine of 0.5 x okay now they want us to look at the area under the graph from pi over 3 out to 3 pi over 2 3 pi over 2 is like three quarters of the way around the circle on the ferris wheel so i'm just going to set up my window right now and say hey why don't we go from nothing over to 2 pi right we'll go all the way around the ferris wheel where the tick marks are doesn't really matter. Now, for the y's. Sine normally wobbles between negative 1 and 1, but there's a 2 in front, so I'm going to put in here negative 2 and 2. Now, I'm not going to see a full 3 quarters of a cycle because of this 0 0.5 here. It actually does a little expansion to the graph. And when I try this out, let me double check to make sure I'm in radians. I am. OK, here's the graph of two times the sine of half x. And they're saying, well, hey, use some ribbons and see if you can estimate the area underneath that graph from this starting value, pi over three, all the way out to three pi over two. There is a feature in your graphing calculator where it will go and put a whole bunch of ribbons in, see what it gets. It's kind of like, it's kind of like this picture here. You know, it might get 20.75. And then it will try it again with twice as many ribbons, see if the number changes, then twice as many again, and it keeps doing it until the number stabilizes, until it can't notice a difference. And here's where it is. It's under calculate. So you go second calculate. It's option number seven. And it says, OK, lower limit, please. So I have to type in my starting x value. So I would just type in pi divided by three and hit enter. And then it's like, all right, I can see where we're starting. Where do you want to stop? And I want to stop at three pi over two. So I'm going to just type it in, 3 pi divided by 2. When I say go, it'll try out a few ribbons, then more, and then more, and then more, and then more until it's happy. And then once it's happy, it shows you what the picture looks like. It's like, wow, check out all these little ribbons, a whole bunch of them, super fine. And it says, all right, I've got an answer for you. And so it says, how about this, 6.2925. Two, we only need four decimal places, so I'm going to stop right there. And it's basically done it by a rectangular approximation method, just with the number of rectangles getting smaller and smaller and smaller. OK, three more examples for the day. Uh, example number two is a chemistry story about some reaction that's giving off some CO2 gas over some 60 second period. And they're telling us that the rate of production of gas gradually drops off. So it's continually dropping. And they want you to figure out overall how much gas came out of this chemical reaction. Now, just to get a little bit comfortable with the story, I'm just going to draw a little picture here of you know, roughly what this graph is doing. Right? It's important to note that they said the gas production rate is dropping. So I've got rate going on here, kind of like in our physics story. We had meters per second. This is liters per second. And then we're going to have time going across this axis measured in seconds. And they've told us that the production rate drops off. At time zero, it's pretty high. It's up at 28, then lower, then lower. And what do they have? Six points, four, five, six, right, as we work our way through the day. And that finishes out here at 60 seconds. Well, you know, the actual picture, you know, maybe, maybe there's some sort of curve going on there, straight line, I don't know. We're going to try to estimate the area underneath that graph. And they've actually given us a request that we do both an upper and a lower bound for the true answer. 
Here's what they mean by that. I'm just going to draw in some ribbons here for a minute, just so you can get a feeling for where they would go. If I was to go and attach my ribbons on their left side, if that's what I chose to do, because they've told me that this graph is actually dropping, it's heading down, then if I attach them over on the left side, what I know is that it's going to be overestimating the right answer. It's actually going to give me too much for the area. So this is going to give me a wrong answer, but it will create what we call an upper bound. We'll be able to tell the chemists, well, here's an answer. It's wrong because it's too big. And then they know the right answer is less than that. Now, later on, we're going to go and give them a lower bound. We're going to give them a number that we know is actually too small. It'll be useful for them because then they can go, okay, the true answer is going to have to be more than this lower bound. So those ribbons are going to look like this. They're going to be attached with their right side touching those data points. If the graph is decreasing, right? They've told me this. If the graph is decreasing, then I know what if it's right attached, they're going to be too tiny. So we'll just do this in, in two steps. We'll give them the wrong answer twice. One wrong answer that we know is too high and one wrong answer that we know is too low. So let's start off with the upper bound. Okay, that number we know that is too high. So another way to think of an upper bound is to say this is for sure an overestimate. And if you've got a curve that's decreasing, because they've said so, I know if I do left attach, I'll be fine. But I want you to think about how many ribbons there will be. I've got too many fence posts here, so I don't want to go and grab all of these fence posts. If I go to do my left attach story, I'm going to grab these five, just those five, to figure out how much gas there is. So here goes, going to find the area under that curve, right? Here's my upper bound. Okay, that area, which will actually be gas production, just figuring out these rectangles, I'm going to go 28. That's actually liters per second multiplied by 12 seconds, right? Every one of these little ribbons is going to be 12 seconds long, right? When we go for these little runs and there are five of them, there's one, here comes the next 18.6 times 12 plus. 13.5 times 12, and then two more, just two more, 9.7 times 12 plus 7.2 times 12. Now you have to stop there. You've actually got all five of your ribbons in, and you don't want to have that 5.4 get included in the calculation right, because of that fence post issue. So that ends up being 924 liters because you've been multiplying liters per second by seconds this number that you've got is for sure too high so it's an upper bound the correct answer is less than that so this is a ceiling on the right answer okay great now let's do the lower bound let's give them a number that we know is too low it'll be helpful to them okay so this is going to be an underestimate Now, please don't think that every time you do a, a RRAM that it's an underestimate. It's true this time because it's a decreasing function. And when I attach my ribbons on the right, they will be under the curve. So yeah, this is going to be an underestimate. I'm going to go and grab some, some nice points here attached on the right. I'm going to grab five, just five, those ones. I'm going to use the 5.4, but not the 28. So the area under the graph, which will actually be liters of gas, it's going to be 18.6 for 12 seconds plus 13.5 for 12 seconds plus 9.7 for 12 seconds plus 7.2 for 12 seconds and the 5.4 for 12 seconds. That ends up being Quite a bit lower, 652.8 liters of gas produced. That is a wrong answer. It's wrong because it's for sure in this story too low, but that could be useful for the chemists. They could look and go, okay, well, that's a lower bound. The correct answer is stuck somewhere in between 
the 652.8 and the 924. Now the next two examples, we're gonna we're gonna kind of push the envelope here a little bit. Maybe doing some questions that are kind of out of place. They might actually be more appropriate for the last chapter of the course, um, but we're gonna try them out anyways. We're gonna see if we can even do some volumes. And here's a story about a, a swimming pool, right? And it starts off with a shallow end. The photocopy doesn't show up super well. And then the pool gets deeper here. And here's the deep end. And we're gonna try to estimate the volume of water that's inside this pool. And we're not gonna be perfect. It's okay not to be perfect. We're gonna do this in, in slabs, like little chunks of water that look like little slabs of water. So it says the width is always eight for the pool but the depth varies with its length. So as you move along the length, along X, you're gonna find the height can change, and that's what's recorded in the table. And it says, hey, could you go and do a rectangular approximation using midpoints with five intervals? Well, if I have to get all the way out to finishing right here at 20, and I'm gonna do it in five intervals, then as I make my steps here, they're gonna be like four each, right? Four meters each. So my first, my first run is gonna go for my ribbon is gonna go from there to there, and then from four to eight, and then from eight to 12, and then from 12 to 16, and then 16 to 20. I'm just gonna to try to do rectangular chunks of water. I know it's not perfect, but I'm kind of thinking about it like this. Like imagine, grab a different color here. Imagine there's a rectangular chunk of water that looks exactly like this. It's gonna be four meters this way, for sure. It's gonna be eight meters that way, but I just don't know how tall it's gonna be. But they've given me this table and they've said, well, why don't you do midpoints? You know, so for that first slab that goes from zero to four, I'm actually gonna be looking at this height right in the middle between the zero and the four. The slab that goes from four to eight, I'm gonna grab that height. And the slab that goes from eight to 12, I'm gonna grab that one. And the slab that goes from 12 to 16, I'm gonna go and grab the 4.4, and then finally this depth of five. Those are right in the middle of those slabs. Okay, so those are the midpoints. Let's go and find this volume. So I know this is really supposed to be about areas, but ah, we can fake this. We can do a volume story. It's just gonna be for those slabs, you know, length times width times height. All right, this is only gonna be an estimate. It will not be perfect, but how about this? The volume is, okay. For this story here, I could go, um, what could we have? We've got a height of two, and then we're gonna multiply by eight, and then multiply by four. The next slab has a height of two, and then eight and four. They're all gonna have that eight and four. The next one is 3.2, eight, four. And then a couple more. Let me just move this back here a little bit. I'm cheating on you. Okay, the next slab is 4.4 deep and eight and four. And then one more. It's gonna be five deep, eight, four. So this estimate of the volume of the pool, it's wrong, but it's the best I can do right now, 531.2, that would be meters cubed. Is it perfect? No, but it's what today is all about. Just coming up with some rectangles, in this case, little rectangular prisms in order to come up with our best guess for what that volume's gonna be. Last one, getting a little fancy here now. It says, see if you can approximate the volume of the nose cone of an airplane, shown below. Now we're gonna approximate it by a whole bunch of little cylinders. See if we can get that to work. Um, the height of the curve of the nose cone is given by some square root function. Okay, great. And the whole nose cone is 2.4 meters long. Fantastic. And it says, why don't you consider using a right approximation with just four intervals, four little cylinders. It's gonna be like four little hockey pucks that actually form this nose. So it's the first time we've ever done this. This is gonna be a little technical, 
So let's spend a moment together here and just draw what these little hockey pucks are going to look like as we work our way along the airplane. So this is let X going this way. And I've got this curve that they've told me all about. Okay, fantastic. Right, some square root function. Great. Got that there. And we're going to go as far as 2.4. That's where the story's over. And they've said, would you mind doing this in four little sections? Okay, sure. Cutting this up. Okay, four sections. I got to get to 2.4. So 2.4 divided by by 4 is 0. 0.6. So that would be 0. 0.6 meters along. This would be 1.2 meters along, 1.8 meters along, and then finally 2.4 meters along. And I'm going to think of this airplane as being made up of little pancakes, little hockey pucks. So I'm going to I'm going to cheat on you just because it, it's going to look nicer, and I'm going to just draw little hockey puck kind of on its side. Okay, so I'm just going to spin this around. And I'm going to make the hockey puck big enough to fit in here. This is going to be the hockey puck that goes from 1.2 all the way out to 1.8. That's my plan. I need to work on it a little bit, so give me just a second. Okay, let's make this a little more transparent so you can see through it. Okay, so there's there's my hockey puck. I'm going to have to thin this thing down a little bit so it fits in there. Great. And they have said that this hockey puck needs to be, they said, right attached. So right now it's not attached on the right. I want it to attach here. So I need to extend the, the diameter of this hockey puck a little bit, kind of like that. And it's actually just four separate little pancakes that are going to make up this nose cone. I don't, I don't want to try putting all four in because if I do, I'll, I'll make a big mess of this. But I'll just I'll try for a second, right? The first one goes here. And then there's another one that fits in here, getting a little bigger, right, like that. And then another one in here. But I think by now I've probably kind of made a total mess of this. So let me erase most of those. And let's just think about that one. All right, each one of these little pancakes has some sort of radius to it. Well, that's actually just the height of that square root curve. They're going to have some thickness to this hockey puck. Maybe I'll just call that like L for a minute. And I guess the volume would be pi r squared times L, the length of it that way. Okay, going to make my estimate. This is kind of above and beyond what we should be doing on this day, but we're going to give it a try. So my volume for the airplane nose cone, best guess, I'm going to do this four times. I've got pi times, now the radius, I have to do the radius squared. To find the radius, I'm going to go and find these y values along the curve. i right? got four of them to do. First one occurs at 0.6 for x. Okay, well the function they told me was 1.2 times the square root of whatever x you're at. So I'll put in an x value of 0.6. That stuff right there is going to go and figure out the height of that curve. That's going to be my radius, so I have to square it. Then I have to multiply it by my L. How thick is that little pancake? That's going to be 0.6. Okay, that's one of them. Let's move on. If you're, if you're looking at it going, oh, I don't quite have a feeling for that, let me put in a couple more in and it might feel a little bit better. Okay, the next little pancake. Pi times, I'm going to put the radius in here, squared. That'll be 1.2 times the square root of your x location at the end of the pancake. That would be 1.2. And then it's 0.6 tall. Two more. Pi. I'm going to find out the y value for that graph because it's my radius. So I'm going to go, according to my curve here, 1.2 times the square root of, this would be a 1.8. That's the x value at the end of the third the little pancake. That's the one you can see there. And then that gets multiplied by 0 0.6. And one more pancake.
that last pancake is going to have its x value at 2.4 squared times how tall it is if you lie that pancake on its face, 0 0.6. It ends up being, if you try this out, it ends up being 16.2860 meters cubed. So, you know, today wasn't really supposed to be about finding volumes, um, but it's interesting how we can actually make that approximation by doing this. Um, and so that's the rectangular approximation method where we just chunk it up into some nice big chunks and we decide whether we want to attach on the left or the right or in the middle. Um, it's not perfect, but give it a little bit of time and we can make this thing be perfect.